The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, so welcome to the Stoa, everyone. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And uh, today we have Jim Rutt. Uh, Jim is a former businessman, entrepreneur, um, chairman of the Santa Fe Institute, and the host of the Jim Rutt Show. I'm not even gonna try to do his, <laughs> his intro, but he's the host of the Jim Rutt Show. Uh, he's one of the OGs in the uh, game B space. And he's here to talk about something called Proto B. Um, and let me, like, I think this was the article, this Medium article where he first mentioned it, um, the journey to game B, and he had a distinction between pre uh, B, like uh, Proto B, and then game B. Uh, so we're gonna talk about Proto Bs, and then we're gonna talk about this thing he's working on called the Proto B incubator. And um, I'm not sure if Jim is coming. I didn't have a chance to talk to him beforehand about the structure of this uh, session, but I imagine we'll be, unless he wants something otherwise, we'll do the standard format. Uh, Jim and I will, will talk for the first port, uh, portion and then uh, we pivot to Q&A. Put your questions in the chat anytime. I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question, Jim. If you don't want to be on YouTube, indicate that and I'll read your question on your behalf. That being said, Jim, welcome to the STOA. Uh, let's see if you can unmute yourself. No. All right, now there I can unmute. Go. All right, sorry for being a couple minutes late here. Typical screw ups. I was going to do it from my podcasting uh, booth. And I, then as I sat down and started doing it, I go, shit, my podcasting computer doesn't have a camera. <laughs> so I had to run back to my other computer and then it wanted to update Zoom. So here I am. Uh, anyway, great to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, telling people a little bit about uh, the idea of Proto B and sort of where we are and uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Proto B incubator, uh, which we are just in the process of launching to help uh, you know, accelerate and lower the activation energy for people to build actual proto bees. So did you have something uh, um, prepared to speak on or do you want to have like a uh, back and forth? Uh, yeah, I do. I got a couple of few uh, starting comments. Let me go do some back and forth. Should I cool. assume everybody knows what game B is or should I hit a early uh, quick intro to game B? Uh, maybe like a quick elevator pitch for game okay. B and then you know, essentially, uh, game B is not game A. That's, we start with that. Uh, game A is our current uh, societal operating system, uh, which we can say at one level uh, goes back to the invention of agriculture 10,000 years ago. And at another level, uh, can be thought to have uh, revved into a new level of uh, acceleration in the 17th century with the invention of science and the rudimentary beginnings of modern finance. Uh, I think it, we could say it accelerated again with the development of fossil fuels and steam driven industrial revolution in the 19th century. Uh, and then accelerated again in the 20th century with electricity and oil, and then turned to, uh, its most recent turn to what I call the late modern era about 1975, uh, you know, where we, uh, where we started to see truly hyper financialized capitalism. Uh, computation getting cheaper all the time on Moore's law. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally the uh, move to the, wor the world to being online and all this it has he essentially ended up with a series of ever faster uh, technological and social evolutions that seem to have no breaks at all. And they're heading us to the cliff uh, that those of us in the game B world refer to as the meta crisis. Uh, where our uh, technologies and capacities to do good or evil seem to have uh, far exceeded uh, our wisdom and our ability to control them. And of course, in late day uh, game A, we're seeing this phenomena of uh, uh, bad faith information uh, uh, propagating over social networks, creating, uh, you know, reducing our sense making capacity even further. So we're really in a, in a bad, uh, uh, bad situation. Uh, game B is the alternative. Uh, it's not fully defined yet, but has some fundamentals. Uh, one, it should be self-organizing uh, rather than top-down and hierarchical. It should be network-oriented. And you know, while the network has caused some of the game A, late game A problems, it's not going away. 
and we should learn how to use it as a tool for human fulfillment should be decentralized, again, closely related to self-organizing, but with a difference uh, in that uh, we hope that it self-organizes at a series of scales and not just big, right? That it has uh, a fractal nature from small to large and that it from the very beginning considers itself metastable, i.e. specifically thought through to exist for a long period of time. Number I use is 500 years. I use the word metastable rather than stable to emphasize the fact that it needs to be continually evolving. It's not going to be one thing. Uh, it's going to be the idea of game B, which kind of goes like this over time uh, as we see the coevolution uh, of ourself, our planet, and our capabilities. Uh, and, you know, in terms of why we should do this, uh, we think that game B is about maximizing uh, human potential and flourishing, not just money on money return. Uh, and it's also, at least personally, my personal vision of it, Game B should be a society where irrespective of people's biological and social endowments, everybody should be able to live a life of autonomy and dignity. That should be a key design parameter built into our social operating system. And to my mind, a sign that we're on the right track is when honesty and good faith uh, become once more pillars of our society and not sucker strategies as they are now in late game A. So that's a you know, quick introduction to game A uh, and game B. Any quick uh, questions or comments or, uh, or probes, Peter? Yeah, I like it. Especially like the, the sucker strategy uh, phrase. Um, Literally, that was where game B started in the conversation between Jordan Greenhall and, and I probably in 2008. We've tracked all of our work back to that one conversation. Uh, and when we, you know, I talked about my early career in the 70s before it became a sucker strategy. And we realized what the fuck kind of society is honesty <laughs> and good faith a sucker strategy in? And then we said, oh, it's our society. Uh, this cannot be good. And literally, that was the insight that put Jordan Hall and I, uh, and then many others later, onto this road. And what was what year was that when that conversation happened? Probably two thousand eight or so. Wow. And then, of course, years before we actually formally launched the Game B effort. But uh, he and I had been involved in a many years conversation before we even got to that point. And it literally was all about the realization. Uh, that if honesty and good faith is a sucker strategy, there is something deeply wrong with this, with that society. Right, right. So I think that's a good overview of Game B. And uh, I imagine most people are aware of it. Um, so what is a proto B? All right. Yeah, let me, let me just a little bit of transition to that is that, you know, uh, Game B got rolling in 2013. Uh, had, it's had some ups and downs in terms of how much energy and people have been involved. It's uh, uh, definitely gathering strength uh, currently. People that want to learn more about it, go to the Game B group on Facebook. It's probably the best place. Uh, since 2013, there's been a considerable amount of theory developed. Uh, people like Jordan Hall, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Brett Weinstein, and a growing number of new original thinkers in the Game B group on Facebook who have been uh, thinking through what does it mean to do these things we talked about as, that are the pillars of uh, Game B. Uh, however, so far, it's all been theory. Uh, there's a growing sense, and it's certainly uh, shared by me, that it's time to move from pure theory to practice. Uh, you know, I, as Peter mentioned, I'm a business guy. I used to be retired now. Uh, I like to do things, I like to make things happen in the world. And as a student of complexity science, I also understand the limits to our ability to predict complex systems prior to actually trying them. And so uh, there's many of us in the Game B community who are now committed to moving uh, out of the world of just theory to the world of actual practice. And one of these efforts is called Proto B. Uh, and uh, Proto B is the idea of having uh, coherent groups of people attempting to live, to live a Game B life that can be thought of as whole, i.e. it is actually Game B, if not yet totally complete. Uh, what do I mean by not complete? Uh, it seems unlikely that any uh, reasonable group of uh, uh, Game B people living together on the ground are going to make their own computer chips or build their own airplanes. Uh, so it's a very important part of the Proto B concept that it's open, that it's a membrane uh, around the community, but it's open to things coming in, things going out. 
Uh, proto bees should not be uh, isolated uh, little cells trying to do their thing on their own. Uh, in terms of the scope uh, for various reasons, and this comes from theory, uh, we're thinking, we're gonna try that uh, proto bees ought to be on the order of the Dunbar number, 150 people, something like that in each node on the ground. Not to say that a bunch of these nodes couldn't be very close to each other and kind of operate as a town. So think of as, you know, uh, neighborhoods inside of a town, or it might just be standalone uh, neighborhoods of 150 people, etc. And then here's the other important part is those things aren't standalone. The wider community of proto bees will be interoperating with each other uh, online, economically, perhaps with their own currencies, et cetera, uh, and cooperatively attempting to gain uh, some of the you know, scale of bigness, uh, you know, things like uh, the fact that we know that in cities, for instance, uh, the number of patents is uh, super linear. The, the bigger the city, the more patents per capita. Uh, of course, we also know that things like crime are also super linear with scale uh, and uh, psychological illness and just plain old illness. So uh, part of the idea of Proto B is to have let humans live at the small scale uh, that are most humane and we think uh, best for human flourishing. And yet through uh, network connectivity and self-organization, be able to take advantage of super scalar uh, large size of eventually, we hope, uh, the Proto B set of communities. Uh, in terms of whether, where they can be, uh, in theory, they could be anywhere. It could be urban, uh, small town, or rural, though I would say so far, uh, the bulk of the energy has been either small town, rural, or something in between those two. Uh, but there's nothing in principle that says a proto B couldn't be built in uh, downtown Detroit, for instance. Uh, the other uh, aspect of what a proto B is, is from the beginning, it needs to seriously consider how it is embedded in game A, right? As I said, we're not trying to be isolationists uh, who are completely uh, unattached to game A. And in fact, quite the opposite. From the very, very beginning, one of the core theories of how game B was gonna be built uh, was by parasitizing game A, quite literally in the true biological sense. Uh, we expect proto bees to develop the capacity to compete in the game A world and actually outcompete uh, game A alternatives, at least in certain niches, and thereby extract resources from game A, which can be used to build game B. So what's an example of that? One I like to use just because it's so homey and, and kind of, uh, you know, non-tech is auto repair. Uh, in the game A world, one of the most corrupt businesses is the auto repair business. There's a whole bunch of reasons why uh, they sell you repairs you don't need. They sell you uh, Chinese fake parts uh, that aren't the actual real parts. Uh, sometimes they charge you for parts they don't even put in the car. Uh, they charge you book hour rates rather than the rates that the people actually worked on it. Uh, so there's a lot of late game A rottenness in the auto repair business. One can imagine a game B auto repair business that was uh, cooperatively owned by the people that work there, uh, that operated a high level of honesty and integrity and transparency, just little things like, uh, hey, we'll give the parts back to you and we take them out of your car. Oh, by the way, we give you the box that the new parts came in. So you can see that they're uh, the actual OEM parts you paid for and not uh, cheap, uh, cheap knockoffs, et cetera. Uh, so there's an example about uh, the ability of a game B business entity to outcompete game A and bring resources back into the community. Uh, I have a long list of, of such game B ventures, but I think that's going to be a very important part of the proto B mindset. We're not isolationists. We're actively engaging game A and looking to beat it at its own game, use those resources uh, to con uh, continue to build uh, the game B world. Um, in terms of uh, elements that Proto bees would do differently. Uh, you know, some of the ones we think about are parenting. Uh, this is a particular love of mine in that as I uh, start talking, I've talked to lots of millennials and, and other young folks uh, over the last couple of years. And it seems to me that unless you're in the economic elite uh, in you know, Silicon Valley or finance or management consulting or something, it's become increasingly difficult to have a high quality of child rearing a community that you feel, you know, proud to let your kids just run around loose in, uh, you know, uh, other parents that, that share your values with you, 
good quality education, et cetera. So I see uh, for many proto bees, one of the organizing principles uh, is likely to be what is good for young families with children? Uh, and that probably means multi-generations. Uh, you know, this idea of the nuclear family living by itself in a house or an apartment is really very new and not how humans have lived. So I can imagine a proto bee of 150 adults uh, consisting of some you know, young parents with children, but then some old retired farts like me, right? Who can you know, pro help do some babysitting, you know, teach the kids how to do things, uh, you know, teach them how to butcher a hog or something like that, right? And uh, uh, so, but with a lot of focus on uh, child development, because that's really what the future is about, right? It's our children. Uh, I mentioned education, food. We think that uh, proto bees will, uh, many of them, though not all, will have common dining halls, for instance, and the food will be clean food, not industrial food, uh, which then leads to health. Uh, it's you know, kind of perverse in game A uh, that the healthcare industry is actually not the healthcare industry, it's the treatment of sickness industry. Uh, and a uh, you know, key uh, proto B idea uh, is that if we live together correctly with the right uh, ways of living, uh, that we can really focus on our health rather than merely, uh, you know, curing sickness. Um, one of the, again, one of my pet uh, uh, ideas for proto bees and for game bee more generally is that proto bees should develop the, the strong capability and capacity in the area of conviviality. Uh, the idea of sitting down and uh, eating a dinner together and drinking and singing and dancing and partying. Uh, and, you know, that's really what our human bodies want. Uh, that's what we were evolved to do. Uh, and one could imagine skill and conviviality perhaps replacing uh, having more objects in terms of status. You know, someone who knows how to throw a great dinner party uh, ought to have more status, it seems to me, than somebody who buys a Porsche 911. And so I th we think we see that as an important part of the Proto B experience. Uh, housing also, uh, you know, a key uh, uh, deliverable to my mind for people who join Proto Bs is once you become accepted into a Proto B, there's never any risk that you'll be homeless. You'll always have a home. Uh, housing will be built into the Proto B concept, and yet they'll be designed to be light on the earth, likely to be quite small, uh, but nice, uh, because there'll be a lot of shared uh, resources like uh, meeting rooms, office space, uh, maker spaces, computer labs, etc. So the houses don't have to uh, have all those things and the house is just a place to sleep and hang out. And so they can be small and efficient and light on the earth. Uh, let's see. Well, that's, I think enough would give you a sense of some of the ideas of things that we would uh, 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 imagine happening in proto bees. Uh, so Peter, thoughts, comments? Yeah, yeah, but yeah before we go to the Proto B incubator. I do have a few questions, um, and I'll take in Bonita in a moment. Uh, but when the Stoa first started, when when um, in, in March, uh, I was referring to it as a Proto B just based off your article, and hearing you talk about it now, it's it's explicitly it seems like in person um, thing that you're referring to as. Uh, so with that frame, I'd, I'd like to take in Bonita for her for the first question. Hey Jim. Hey Bonita. Um. Yeah, so I know you can answer this question. Um, I'll just try to uh, throw it out there so you can carry it along. Um, it has two parts. One is a lot of what you're describing, and you and I both get into this, sounds like an old form of community, an old society, right? Rural, traditional rural, maker, echo village. Like, is a Quaker village a proto Genby, or is that? an old form. And so we're trying to figure out why is game B beyond or different than, what are the, what are the different challenges to be truly game B? And it's not kind of a, a recapitulation of an old form. I understand why we have to reclaim that. That's not, it's not a crit critique, but I think it'd be helpful for you to, to make that distinction. And then we might actually think of what Peter said, like is Stoa a proto game B? I mean, we are not locally, uh, we're, I don't know, maybe it's a kind of an education community proto game B. I, I, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see whether it qualifies or, or doesn't qualify. 
Yeah, um, both, both great questions. Uh, let me start with the second one first, because it's easier. Uh, I would distinguish uh, between proto uh, bees, which are by definition, at least the definition I chose to use in uh, my writing and work so far, on the ground communities versus game bee ventures, which are any kind of people working collaboratively to do game bee things. Strikes me the STOA is a very classic and very impressive uh, game bee venture. By venture, I don't necessarily mean that it's designed to make money, uh, though at least it has to provide enough economic resources to keep itself in being one way or the other. Uh, but for instance, a babysitting club uh, could be a game B venture or a time bank where no money uh, uh, passes uh, you know, hands and it's ways for people to interoperate. But I would distinguish the game B ventures uh, from uh, the uh, proto B. Uh, now, a good question about what distinguishes proto bees from other kinds of intentional communities, echo villages, etc. And to my mind, I think one of the biggest is that from the beginning, we see this as a means to an end and not an end in itself. Uh, a proto bee is not a one off. Uh, we are not uh, going to encourage people. Uh, to build a proto B just so they can re retire from the world and do their own thing. Uh, but rather very consciously, this is part of the first steps in a worldwide many year evolution and then maybe someday revolution uh, to change the world. Uh, also, all proto Bs should be expected to be in strong intercommunication and communion with the other proto Bs. Uh, you know, we, we talk about some in the paper uh, the idea of X in the box and horizontal sharing of what works, the gradual trial and error and accumulation of learning so that new proto bees can take advantage of the learnings of old proto bees. There's some modest discussion about horizontal uh, economic sharing. In fact, uh, Jordan Hall and I are in a very intense, almost daily conversation about designing uh, a proto bee. Uh, he calls it civium, but they're really the same thing. Uh, 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 economy in which we have literally a separate monetary system that would go across all the proto bees and help us self-organize uh, collective endeavors in both the economic and non-economic uh, uh, range. The third, I think, is the emphasis that I talked about earlier, which is consciously and always thinking about how to actively parasitize uh, game A. And again, this is uh, the opposite of the withdrawal attitude that uh, many other uh, such groups have. Uh, we understand game A is big, it is powerful, it is dangerous, and we have to actively engage it and, uh, and work to beat it at its own game in places using uh, our techniques. And again, uh, kind of to summarize, uh, I think the fundamental big difference here is that this is a uh, exponential strategy and that this is just the first step and that, uh, you know, most Eco villages or other intentional communities, even the Amish or the Quakers, uh, you know, don't see hundreds of millions of people doing this uh, in the future while we do. Any follow up, B? You're on mute. I, I know because I have dogs back here. Um, yeah, I mean, just a comment, you know, I, I, I keep this is very similar to the question we had for Chomsky, you know, like because game B has this parochial flavor. You're from somewhere. You build a habitus. That's going to make a certain type of person a certain experience. But we want this to network in a planetary scale, supposedly. And there's always the threat of some kind of cosmopolitanism, uh, uh, lowest common denominator. And I think that's really, it's interesting. It's you know, we, we wouldn't put Jim Rutt and Noam Chomsky in the same place, but I think there's interesting kind of conceptual, uh, uh, interesting territory there. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. Again, and this is something that I pound on all the time in our Game B, uh, Proto B Incubator, which we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, which is there is not one set of Proto B settings on all these issues that we think about. Uh, strongly encouraging experimentation. Think about, and one, uh, for the reason you talk about, we don't want a monoculture. And two, frankly, we don't know enough. You know, uh, we can take all the smart people we know, put them in a room and design a proto bee, and the probability of it being designed correctly to flourish is pretty low. Uh, so I see the next several years as, as being starting various proto bees, each one with different settings. 
Uh, to give an example, one of the areas I've studied very deeply uh, to learn about uh, how these things work is the Israeli kibbutz movement. There's uh, about 300 communities. And over time, well, they all started with a very similar constitution. Over time, they've evolved in separate directions. And one of the big fundamental differences is the amount of egalitarianism in them. Uh, some, about 20% of uh, uh, Israeli kibbutzes have stuck to the original tradition of being 100% economic egalitarianism, i.e. all the economics are shared exactly. Everybody has exactly the same house, the same clothes, etc. cetera. Uh, on the other extreme, there's a few that have gone all the way to almost Ayn Randian Gulch, Gulch uh, extremes that are, you know, hyper-capitalist, and there's a bunch in between. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I suspect that that setting, as long as, as well as many others, uh, will be uh, something that we will discover over time. In fact, we may find various points in configuration space that work. Uh, the other one you alluded to in uh, your questions is making new humans. In the game B, the wider game B conversation, we refer to this as psychotechnologies, uh, includes basically everything that can modify who we are as people, things like meditation, contemplative practices, yoga, tai chi, uh, but also things like medical psychotherapy, psychedelic drugs, nootropics, transcranial magnetic or electrical stimulation, even brain implants, right? Uh, you know, how do we, how do we make changes in the capacity of the human element because the institutions we build are made from the human elements. And as we upgrade the capacity of the human elements, um, then the institutions we can build are different. Uh, and I expect that there'll be radical differences in which psychotechnologies different proto bees will choose. Uh, some will use relatively modest uh, amounts of psychotechnology. I suspect some proto bees, uh, psychotechnologies will be a core part of uh, uh, their strategy and definition of what they're doing. Uh, truthfully, what will work best? I don't know. Uh, that's why I encourage people to experiment. I have my own views, uh, probably pretty well known for those who listen to my podcast, uh, but I, I expect that the uh, Game B, uh, Proto B community will try different settings in the areas around psychotechnologies. And I hope they do. Cool. Um... So before we go into the Proto B incubator, uh, is there any existing um, communities that you would say are Proto B? And Monastic Academy is the first one that's that's coming to my mind. Uh, I don't know of any again because of the fact that they're not hooked into this idea of be a part of being a process and community and with built-in horizontal communications, possibly economic exchange, etc. Uh, so now those could join up, and I do think uh, that once proto bees have some existence proof that this isn't just an idiotic idea, uh, we'll probably find other existing communities that may want to join. And because of the fact uh, that we have this radical pluralism, or which I call coherent pluralism, uh, where there's no demand at all that everybody at attempt to do this the same way. I think the opportunity for existing communities to uh, join up, be loosely coupled with the Proto B movement is quite powerful. All right. So, what's uh, this Proto B incubator you guys got cooking up, Jim? Let us know. Ah, well, it's new. It's only about five weeks old, maybe a little more, six weeks. I'll have to go back and look. Uh, a theme from the very beginning of Game B and even the work that uh, we did before Game B uh, has always emphasized that to make reactions happen, you have to lower the activation energy for them to happen. This is an idea from classic physical chemistry. Uh, and in chemistry, you often find a catalyst is the magic that allows much less energy than you would think to cause the reaction to occur. So let's think of going from people living in game A to pulling together and forming and actually successfully launching a proto B. There is a lot of energy that has to go into that in terms of figuring out what's, how are we gonna govern it? How is it gonna govern itself? Uh, what are its settings in this design space about things like egalitarianism, psychotechnologies, childcare, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, how is it gonna get funded? Uh, how's its legal entity structure going to uh, work? Uh, 
you know, how's it going to deal with things like land use regulation, which turns out to be a real bugger? Uh, you, know, you know, what does it need to know about sewer and water, et cetera? And for people standing by themselves to solve all these problems on their own is really hard. And if you don't solve them all correctly, your proto B will fail. And so the idea of the incubator was to pull together uh, basically three groups of people. Uh, one is people working on the framework uh, for proto bees. And again, this is a, keep in mind, this is not a prescriptive framework, but rather a dimensional analysis. What are the dimensions of designing a proto bee and what are the possible settings and exploring them? Uh, the second uh, part of uh, the incubator is domain experts. We've now got a uh, medium sized and growing body of experts and uh, you know, the areas of expertise that we currently have are education, governance. Uh, let's see here, I actually wrote them all down. Where the hell are my, uh, my uh, things here? Uh, Non-traditional construction, uh, land trusts, uh, small group governance and finance, um, rapidly uh, reaching out to try to find people who are experts in hacking of land use regulations uh, and building codes uh, I've got my, a good line on a sewer and water expert. Uh, I expect we'll have alternative energy experts on, on board. And the idea is having this body of experts available to team starters will help lower their activation energy, particularly when, when they can put it in the context of the framework to make sure they don't miss anything. And of course, the third and most important part of the incubator are actual community starters. Uh, groups of people who are either right now trying to build a community or are uh, seriously and actively in the planning stage. And so those are really the three things that we want to bring together in the incubator uh, and uh, lower the activation energy and increase the probability of success of the launches. That's the idea, pretty simple. Mm. So to double click on the first category, the framework architects, and then the, the third category, um, anyone, can you let us, if, if it's not secret, who's involved in that? Well, yeah, there's some, uh, let's, I'm going to not name all the people at this point in time, uh, but there's some people that are well known in the game B community. I'll leave it at that. In the, on the framework side in particular. And is there, um, cause I'm aware of some people in the third category is, is, can we speak on that at this point or um, that's top secret too? Yeah, again, none of, this, none of this is top secret, but we're trying to operate in a low key, small group fashion for the time being. Uh, and currently there are four, let's see, is that right? One, two, three, four groups of active um, community starters uh, on the incubator. And uh, we'll be recruiting a few more as we go along here. Uh, so again, I'll, I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah, I think a lot, frankly, for a lot of people, they're, they're best off working in the planning period out of the bright light of day. And if uh, someone uh, watches this video, wants this up on YouTube, and they want to reach out to you or the the Proto B, be a part of the Proto B incubator, how would they go about that? Send an email to Jim Rutt at game b dot org. Cool. Um, so, is there anything else uh, you want to add before we pivot to some uh, of the Q and A's? Uh, I would just add that the Game B incubator is brand new and a work in progress. Uh, it's currently uses a mix of uh, online uh, community using a fairly old school platform called Basecamp, which has some interesting history in the Game B world, uh, and uh, the use of regular uh, video meetups, both all hands, which we, we do about monthly, uh, and any member is uh, uh, encouraged to uh, do an ad hoc video on any topic. Uh, and if they want to bring in one of the experts, that's good. Or if they just want to uh, caucus on a topic, they can. Uh, you know, I'll be damn glad when this pandemic's over so we can add face-to-face -to, -face to that. I'm a giant believer in face-to-face -face as uh, uh, way better than any virtual. So uh, today we're uh, trying to be uh, uh, diverse in the virtual tools that we use, uh, but we will add face-to-face -face, uh, once it's safe to do so. Cool. So um, some of these questions are going to be about the concept of Proto B, and then some of them are going to be about the incubator. So it's going to be a, a mix. Uh, but I will take in um, Paul first. 
Paul, are you there? Yeah. Yep. Um, let's see. I've asked a couple. Um, which one were you thinking of? Uh, I'll do my last one. So uh, I guess it, it's my question is around capitalism. Um, there's the quote that's uh, attributed to a couple different folks, but uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, to what extent do you see game be extending capitalism in its current form and versus replacing it with something more meta stable and less uh, sort of all consuming? Yeah, we certainly would be not seeing our operating system being anything like hyper financialized capitalism where the where the inner engine is short term money on money return, which then couples to every other uh, social and business cycle. Uh, so I think uh, we can say that uh, that pretty definitively. Uh, I, I believe we've also identified that in an, particularly in an era of super technology, uh, it, having a system that's built strictly around rivalrous competition is dangerous. Uh, there's a whole series of game theoretic uh, arguments. Uh, I would point you to Brett Weinstein and Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, who uh, have identified the fact that if you combined uh, uh, unrelented rivalness with super technology, uh, the result is not going to be good. Uh, so I think that uh, what we're looking for is something that can attack these fundamental generator uh, causes of our meta crisis, uh, such as hypercapitalism, uh, unrestricted rivalry uh, in the context of hyper technology, and yet are not top down, uh, are not uh, totalitarian. Uh, and involve a fair amount of voluntary exchange. Uh, so I would suggest that uh, at least my flavor of Game B is likely to have uh, some trade and markets in it, some voluntary uh, interactions, uh, but in a very different context than what we think of as uh, late stage capitalism. I also have some very specific ideas on how our monetary institutions have channeled us into this world we are in today. And so I think it's extraordinarily important that we experiment with uh, other forms of social signaling, uh, you know, things like money or money like things or things that aren't like money, but nonetheless uh, flow like money. And so uh, maybe uh, more of an answer than you're looking for, but uh, that's my thoughts on that question. Any quick follow up, Paul? No, I'm good. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Valeria, you had a, a question above. If you can unmute yourself and ask it to Jim. Uh, sure. Hi. Um, my question was regarding self selection of the people who would be the uh, photo B people. I imagine that they will be highly self selected. For example, in regards to personality traits, I imagine that it will be people who are less competitive or, or I mean, they will be self, uh, there will be a large degree of self-selection there. And if you see Proto B as a prototype for the large scale game B, um, could there be a problem when you try to include everybody that the solutions that have developed there developed for a part of the population who is not representative of the whole? Thank you. Yep, very good question. And you are almost certainly correct uh, that the people who self select into the early proto bees uh, will not be very similar to, say, a random collection of 150 people. Uh, and I, my answer to that, and I've thought about this quite a bit, and we've talked about it some, uh, is that nonetheless, we need to optimize for what we have. Because the first thing we have to do is get our proto bees to work. But as we grow, and this is the beauty about uh, Proto B being a exponential growth system over time, uh, at least growth and exponential until it goes to the top of the S curve and stabilizes, is it will need to be metastable and evolve. So, uh, you know, let's say we have 100,000 people in the first flight of Proto Bs 10 years from now. They will, even those 100,000 people, will not be the same as the next million. And so we need to keep this idea of coherent pluralism front and center. And then as we create new proto bees, they're going to be different, right? They're going to appeal to uh, people with different personalities, different uh, levels of hierarchical complexity, uh, you know, different uh, endowments of all sorts. And so, uh, you know, one, yes, it's true that the early adopters will not be uh, very representative of the population at large, but if we uh, 
keep to the idea of uh, exploration of high dimensional space around the idea of coherent pluralism, I think we have a reasonable chance to evolve so that eventually we have proto bees for everybody. Any follow-up question? Nope, all right. Um, so Tyson, I'm gonna take you in next. Sure, thank you. Uh, hey Jim, my hey, question. Tyson. My question is um, to you, what are the most promising models and thinkers on governance and collective choice making in a proto B? Um, I'm familiar with Richard Bartlett and Forrest Landry, we've through the STOA um, and different processes. Um, and what experiments are you most keen on and would suggest for a group of five to 10 that's um, living together and um, aiming to live together in a proto B way, what are some of those low hanging, uh, maybe low stakes uh, experiments and, and processes to run to, to just to get into this, um, yeah, new ways of collaborative governance and collective choice making? Yeah, at the small scale, uh, there's one person that I am uh, strongest on and that's Rich Bartlett. Uh, I would take a look at his work and I guess I will mention he is one of the uh, experts in the uh, Proto B incubator. Uh, you know, at larger scales, frankly, there's lots of uh, uh, options to look out there with sociocracy, holacracy, et cetera. Uh, truthfully, I'm not sold on any of them. Uh, and I expect that, uh, you know, to design the governance uh, engine for, uh, let's say, 150 person uh, Proto B Dunbar. Uh, is going to require some uh, careful look at what's out there, what's worked and what hasn't worked, and a synthesis uh, from that. Uh, so I don't really have a prescription for what might work at that level, but I would say uh, Rich's stuff seems to me very sensible for a group 10 or under. Any follow-up question, Tyson? No, I don't think so. I mean, it affirms... Um... I'm like, I've been diving into some of Richard's stuff and um, look forward to it. He's doing a Q&A on uh, Friday with the future thinkers on around these topics. So um, we'll just take that opportunity to dive in. Yeah, he's, he has really thought this through. And what I love about uh, Rich is that he is not doctrinaire. Uh, he admits to having previously been doctrinaire, but he has gotten through that and now uh, you know, has theory, but also is a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Ryan, you had a question. Hey, Jim, uh, this is a little bit long-winded, uh, so hopefully bear with me. I really appreciate your time here. Um, it seems like you've pointed towards some of these already, uh, so I'll just go ahead and read it. There seems to be a certain utility and clear selection bias throughout history towards command and control hierarchy and its ability to get things done. And it seems that the effective management of a problem space and its adjacent possible solutions get increasingly confounded the more independent agents are involved. So I'm wondering what the meta structure or framework protocol combination that you're finding when even just talking about proto bees uh, is most useful when orchestrating cohesion towards action. So defining the problem space and then subjective solutions. Um, then Next, once enacted, how do you propose building and maintaining selective membranes, allowing proto bees to engage game A structures uh, while maintaining a homeostatic balance or integrity of the game B ideals? And lastly, um, in listening to one of your conversations with Hansi Freinacht, you mentioned the role of ritual and its function as a process mediator. Uh, so like in the Santa Fe Institute overly polite uh, behavior. Um, how are you using ritual as you think about proto bees with the people you're talking to? And how would you maybe uh, advise people to use ritual or think about ritual when designing proto bee? Uh, first, I'd like to say that I don't consider myself an expert in any of those categories. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the title I've given myself in the proto bee incubator is janitor. Uh, you know, I think my role is more to uh, 
uh, you know, keep the place clean and uh, make sure the, the rooms are open, the lights are on, and that, uh, you know, the people have something useful to say, uh, have, have space uh, to say so. Uh, so I'm not sure I really want to go too deeply uh, into all those things. I would say, you know, find the people that you find that you resonate with uh, and see what you can learn from them. I don't have any prescriptions for those. Though I suppose the one I thought about the most is the last, the idea of the membrane. Uh, I think a lot about the membrane. And, uh, you know, the membrane has, in fact, the work Jordan and I are doing is explicitly uh, ex using uh, the work of John Holland, his most, his last book before he died, a great deep thinker. Let me pull up the name of the book here, John Holland. Sorry for this, but this is officially important. Uh, damn, Google's getting worse all the time. Too many people trying to game it. All right, there we go. Yeah, never mind. I'll send it to Peter and he can put it on the, uh, on the website. Uh, but the idea is that uh, it's very, very important to think consciously about the fact that the thing that's around any given protobee on the ground is a semi-permeable membrane, meaning that uh, it is a membrane, but it is consciously designed for what goes through from the inside to the outside and what comes through from the outside to the inside. And that includes, uh, and back to the uh, Valeria's question about the people, uh, when you're forming a proto B, uh, our, our strong advice, and this also comes uh, through very strongly uh, in the history of the kibbutz and the history of American intentional communities, uh, you know, one needs to be quite specific and have a quite well designed process for who you have in as your members, right? Uh, uh, the evidence is pretty strong that open enrollment is exceedingly dangerous. Maybe somebody smarter than uh, all the other people that have been doing this for the last 200 years can figure out a way to do it with open enrollment, uh, but all the data shows that doesn't work. Uh, you know, secondly, uh, things like the economic model need to be thought through. What goes out, what goes in? As I said, uh, I think one of the differences uh, with the proto B uh, concept is that we are open to there being uh, considerable trade back and forth but it should be conscious and volitional. Uh, and we should say, for instance, whether we're gonna depend on the electrical grid or not, right? Or maybe we are for a while, and then we're gonna transition off. Think about those things that go through the membrane. Next, uh, there's a hierarchy of membranes. Uh, there, a proto itself has a membrane. In fact, uh, in my pencil sketch of a proto uh, there's an internal level called the hamlet, that's, which is inside a proto which is maybe a quarter of the population of each proto And they'll have their own membrane, but probably lighter. Uh, but then you can also think of a membrane that's broader than one proto Again, this idea of civium uh, or the broader society of multiple proto uh, As an example, uh, one of the ones that... Uh, I mentioned in the essay, uh, is that we might, for instance, uh, encourage all proto bees to have a mutual exchange policy that anybody from a proto bee uh, can move from one to the other, uh, at least as a visitor, uh, and get free housing and free food when they do so. Uh, now, probably uh, that would not include the right to permanent membership, but it would be at least for the right to be considered to be a permanent member. So there's an example of a membrane uh, that runs around it. Uh, in the work that we're working on, on economics and currency, we could also imagine a economy of trade between proto bees that does not use fiat currency from the nation state, uh, but rather uses a game B currency specifically designed uh, for inter proto B trade. And again, that's a, I'm defining that, and we've given some thought to uh, how do you manage the exchange rate between, let's call them, uh, uh, I don't remember the name we had for him. We have some name for him. And say US dollars. We could literally have a mechanism uh, for uh, conversion within any given proto B to from this proto B uh, wider system currency into local currencies. And by that, from uh, would create osmotic pressure uh, across the membranes, right? The cheaper it is to buy dollars with the uh, 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 proto B money, uh, the more stuff will come out in from the outside in and vice versa. So I, I suppose the way to think about that is to just be conscious that that's what you're doing. 
and be very, very careful and think in, ter in those terms. Any follow-up question, Ryan? Um, I, I love it. I love the idea of semi-permeable membrane, selective membrane. Um, it just strikes me as such a fragile thing that from first pr design principles of that membrane, you're really choosing, uh, you're really deciding in the future what you're selecting for and the possible outcomes of that selectivity need to be accounted for kind of at the beginning of that design. Um, You're absolutely true, uh, right, that the design of the membrane uh, puts you on a trajectory. However, this is very, very important and speaks to governance, is that none of this stuff should be poured in concrete, uh, certainly not in the early days. The governance process ought to have a mechanism for adjusting the permeability of the membrane, because my hypothesis will be that whatever setting you choose originally will be wrong, and uh, you will learn from it and you need to cycle and learn and adjust. Uh, but, uh, but, but it, I, I believe it's very important to formally uh, instantiate the concept of the semi-permeable membrane so that the thing that you're changing and uh, responding to uh, is a specific thing and not just this loose bag of, uh, of policies and rules. I think it helps us form our institutional structures by having the uh, semi-permeable membrane as uh, something more than just a metaphor. Um, so we're approaching the top of the hour, Jim. Uh, I wanted to, we have a lot of uh, great questions in the chat. Uh, most we didn't get to. So maybe I'll send them to you uh, via email so you can have a look at them. Well, uh, I'm happy to hang in here for longer if, uh, if, if you'd like. Uh, do you have, do you have maybe another 15 minutes? Sure. Um, In fact, they, I think cool. we originally scheduled it for until, uh, one Okay, cool. Um, so let, uh, I'll take in Rob, Rob Hart, if you're still here. Yeah. Uh, can you paste my question? I can't find it in the chat. It was about, uh, um, monetary systems with Proto-B, do you recall? Great. Okay, yeah, my first question. So uh, yeah, Jim, thanks for your time and, and this has been really great. Um, my question was, uh, how do you see the role of um, alternative currencies in Proto-B space? Yep, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Jordan Hall and I are specifically working on a design for a internal Proto-B slash Civium currency right now. Uh, I don't think it's essential. I think we will start Proto-Bs without such a thing, uh, but it's uh, my view, which I could be wrong, uh, that uh, it would be very, very helpful. Uh, and by the way, probably not particularly helpful at the scale of a single Proto-B. Uh, Jordan and I came to that conclusion after very little resource, uh, uh, analysis that, all right, the issues involved in a community of 150 people are, uh, not likely to be substantially upregulated by something as formal uh, as a currency system. And that the, uh, the bulk of the currency system ought to be at the interproto B uh, trade level. And most importantly, that other membrane around all the proto Bs and how the uh, proto B communities interact with game A. So probably more important in the long term than in the short term. Any follow-up, Rob? Nope. All right. Um, let's do Chris. Chris, you had a few questions. Chris C. Yeah, hey, Jim. Um, curious how you see proto-bees co-evolving with the greater holes they're nested in. So a proto-bee in Chicago, how does that relate with the people in the ecosystem of Chicago itself? Of course it will, right? And again, one of the things I highlight in that uh, A Journey to Game B paper is that again, contrary to many intentional communities, uh, I, I at least personally, and it's just me, strongly encourage that the people in a proto B be heavily engaged with their community at the, at the social level. Uh, for instance, uh, in the rural kinds of proto Bs that I'm uh, I've dug in a little bit deeper, you know, join the volunteer fire department. Uh, you know, the Proto-B ought to have a softball team that plays in the rec league. Uh, 
uh, you know, volunteer at the school, even if we don't send our kids to the public school, volunteer at the public school. Uh, and I think all those classes of things, uh, you know, apply whether you're in Detroit or whether you're in Highland County, Virginia, uh, you know, that, you know, we ought to, you know, be part of the community that we're embedded in and not feel like that we're some special class of people who are, you know, withdrawn from the world and are isolated uh, from that community. Uh, you know, at the most simplistic level, even imagine we are in uh, in an urban setting, uh, probably growing food will be part of what we do even in an urban setting. So participate in the farmer's market, participate in the broader community of people who are uh, producers in the farmer's market. One of the things that's really cool about the regenerative agriculture field, permaculture, uh, et cetera, is that there's actually a community of those practitioners not all of whom, in fact, only a very few of whom will be game B. Uh, and so participate in communities uh, that, in which you have some, uh, some nexus. You know, it was a picture that I saw a lot of, like I saw like Proto B going out to the community and doing things. You, do you see any ways that you're imagining that the community might be coming into oh. different group processes or other things Absolutely. like that? Absolutely, very good point. Uh, uh, Mark Fraser, uh, also a member of the Proto B Incubator, makes this point all the time, uh, is that uh, both practical and philosophical reasons, we should be wide open to the community and provide real value added services as early as possible. Uh, for instance, uh, we might operate a charter school and the charter school should be open to anybody in the community. Uh, something I believe will be fundamental to those Proto Bs targeted at uh, families with children will be really super high quality childcare. And I could easily imagine the childcare service being open to the community. Uh, I could imagine there being educational programs, particularly around how to eat uh, good food and how to have uh, non-illness oriented healthcare as a way of life. And so uh, one could, we could have, uh, you know, outreach to the community through community education programs. Uh, here locally, there's a, a whole series of uh, public lectures and public classes that anybody can participate in uh, to the degree that we create something uh, that we think is of value to the wider community. I would encourage people to, uh, you know, go and participate in those kinds of programs to tell our story to the wider world so people can participate with it. Yeah, very nice. And the last thing I had here was curious to know if you've personally tested or heard high praises from any particular technology like regenerative design, EGP, Dave Snowden, SenseMaker, or otherwise? Uh, I don't have a strong opinion at this point in time. I think there's something to be learned from uh, many systems. Uh, I have yet to see any of them uh, that convince me that they're the end all and be all of systems. Uh, I suppose such thing is unlikely to exist. Uh, I did a really good podcast with Dave Snowden, and I think he's got some interesting things. But uh, uh, on the other hand, I don't think he's uh, got the answer to all, all the questions. So uh, be an opportunistic learner is what I'd suggest. Which ones have you gotten into? Too many, uh, and not in enough depth to really be, uh, in, for many of them to be useful. Cool. Um, all right, Mark, you're up next. Hi, Jim. Um, I just wondered if you saw the, the yeah, that's me here. I want, just wonder if you saw the possibility of um, proto bees hiding in plain sight, um, functioning and, and functioning so efficiently that they, they seduce game A players um, away from game, game A to playing game B with, with, like without even knowing that they that they're doing that. I think it's a neat idea. I truthfully haven't thought about it, but uh, I think it's certainly a possibility. Uh, I would say, uh, at least my current thinking, I'm not speaking for anybody else, is that the membranes that I'm at least considering are stronger than that, so that they would be clearly recognizable in the world. But I think it's a very clever idea and, and certainly worth exploring. Uh, could there be a form of stealth proto B? Uh, hmm. Interesting. Any follow-up, Mark? Um, 
Jordan Hall made a comment that we're all playing a game B, but mostly at zero. Um, so do you think, do you feel that's, that's, there's, there's some of that going on in relationships, maybe even in, in the planning of pro to B that's, that's already doing that. That's kind of seducing people. Yeah, I th uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, in my paper, I talk about the fact that before Proto B is what we call pre B, uh, which is those of us who are in our infancy, which is all of us currently, since there are no real Proto Bs on earth. And that there's a whole series of things. Let me pull up my uh, notes here uh, of things that we can be working on for, to get ready for uh, game B or Proto, I should say Proto Bs. Uh, you know, we should try to get ourselves mentally healthy uh, we should try to deprogram ourselves from the matrix of status through possessions. Uh, you know, we should use discernment and the technologies that we use. Uh, you know, I did an experiment and got rid of my uh, smartphone for six months uh, and went back to a flip phone. That was really quite interesting. Uh, I wish the damn thing hadn't have died and then I got seduced back to the damn smartphone, right? Um, you know, I would say consider uh, reducing one's exposure to advertising. Uh, you know, I watch almost no TV with ads. And on the occasions when I do like watching a football game or something, I go, Jesus Christ, what obnoxious shit this is, right? Uh, you know, uh, relatively inexpensive service like Netflix uh, can provide a tremendous amount of entertainment that's not corrupted by manipulative advertising. Uh, you know, clean up one's finances. And I think that's something that uh, I encourage anyone thinking about proto bees. You don't want the debt collector coming after you into the game B world. Uh, you know, learn some real skills. And again, I could see, uh, you know, game B meetups uh, where people learn how to do things you know, around a maker space, perhaps, how to build things, how to cook, how to raise food, et cetera. Uh, and of course, working on our sovereignty, our ability to uh, actually, uh, you know, be sense makers in the world, take responsibility for our actions and be more complete humans are all things that we can and should be working on in the proto in the game B context, but in the pre B uh, epoch prior to people joining up with proto Bs. And for the longest time, I expect there'll be 10 to one, 100 to one uh, people who are pre B rather than proto B. It's a, it'll be a big commitment to become a, uh, a proto B person, uh, but it's a, a lesser commitment and a gradual slope uh, to be a pre B person. All right, uh, so this might be our last question. Uh, Evan, you're up. All right, so I want to preface this question by uh, saying I want to believe like Mulder and the X-Files. So this question may seem critical, but it's coming from a place of wanting to believe. So a topic which comes up recurrently when many of us um, surrounding the STOA and adjacent spaces uh, discuss game B um, is the seeming fact that most, if not all of the game B luminaries are quite successful financially and socially in game A. And that they're also then able to monetize their ideas about game B to support lifestyles, which are mainly out of reach of most of the rest of us who are interested in game B. And so from this perspective, it can be seen as sort of taking up all the air in the room, um, so to speak. So how would you suggest that game B thinkers as a cluster should respond to these dynamics first? And Second, how might the rest of us know that we can trust the incentive of the quote, big brain game B thinkers? You know, well, one, I would say, uh, it's, it's an excellent question. And one I resonate with very strongly, uh, despite being one of those, uh, you know, OG game Bs, right? Uh, and, uh, and that's frankly, one of my motivations to push this proto B idea. I've talked to many, many uh, younger folks in particular. And the thing that comes screaming through is they need a way to make an, a living that's honorable, uh, self-fulfilling and self-actualizing. And they're not finding that in uh, game A. And that is one of the principal reasons that I believe that Proto B ought to be the number one priority uh, for game B over the next uh, few years. And if uh, game B just remains a theory club of a bunch of uh, long-winded uh, baby boomers and Gen Xers, uh, then write it off. Say it was, uh, you know, it's just bullshit, basically. Uh, if we don't convert to on the ground, uh, creating a system by which people can make an honorable living, raise their children uh, in a better fashion than they can in game A, go do something else. So the proof will be in the pudding. Do we deliver or not? 
I should also say, I'm frankly sick and tired of being an OG. I wish some of the younger folks would step up and do more of the work, and they are, by the way. Uh, in the Facebook Game D group, and then the 20 or so satellite uh, Facebook groups that have arisen around these domains, there's a wonderful next generation of leaders uh, and followers that are emerging and are creating uh, you know, valuable content and ideas. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons we encouraged that was for more leadership from younger generations to step forth. And it's actually very interesting The Facebook Game B group, by far the biggest cohort is millennials. Uh, boomers is only 5%. And that's great. Uh, and, you know, it's now time for the, you know, boomers to step up and, uh, and, you know, you know and lead. Any follow-up, Evan? Yeah, super quick follow-up. I just wanted to zoom in on the second part of my question. So how do we, as uh, people interested in this space, know that we can trust the incentives of the big game th B thinkers? Because what I mean by this is if I were going to go join a proto B community that was set up in the image of some of the discussions that the big game B thinkers have, this would involve a huge commitment of the like vast majority of my available resources that I wouldn't be able to replenish for maybe a decade because it's taken me maybe a decade to get to not being completely just totally in debt, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I were to do that, there's a huge amount of trust in the incentives of the people setting up these proto bees that has to be there because I've been involved in intentional communities before that have been complete disasters. And so uh, I'm interested in your thoughts about how we can know whether or not to trust the incentive structures of people setting up the proto bees and of the thinkers that they're basing their proto bee ideas on. Yeah, good question. And I don't think there's any easy answer. Uh, and there isn't, you know, just sort of a magic pill you can take, say, trust this one. Uh, engage, uh, be part of the process, uh, probe, demand radical transparency. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, one of the uh, pre-game B ideas from the old Emancipation Party is radical transparency. I would certainly hope uh, that people building proto Bs uh, adhere to that. So there is no hidden agenda, right? This is not some scheme for Jim Rutt to make money out of a proto B, right? Uh, and, or if it is, that it's be utterly transparent. Uh, so just like anything in life, do your due diligence and be actively engaged. There is no easy answer. All right, um, we'll end here. Um, Jim, any closing thoughts for us or anything that uh, came alive for you while hearing all these questions? Yeah, I love all the questions. They're all right bang on uh, on issues that we all uh, you know need to think about. I think the one that uh, was completely new to me uh, and is gonna, is going to plague me for a while is Mark's question about hiding a proto B in plain mm. sight. Never thought of that idea before, and it is a potentially fertile one. Uh, so uh, uh, it was worthwhile for me to be today just to, for that idea. Uh, I hope I provided some uh, some value and some clarity to uh, uh, to people as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so I'll make some uh, closing announcements in a moment. But Jim, we'd love to have you back, and if any kind of way the Stoa can be a service to the Proto B Incubator Project, just let me know, and uh, we can have further sessions on it. Um, so upcoming events, we have a lot of cool ones on the website. Uh, I'll just post this one. One tomorrow, there's something called Honest Sharing. Some guy in Germany created this modality uh, based off polyvagal theory, I think, and his work in trauma. Um, it's really tight. Uh, that's 1 p.m. Eastern time. We'll probably, I think it went viral in Germany. Uh, so check that out. And uh, Tyson's here. I'm gonna tag him in to uh, talk about his event in our wisdom gym. Sure, thank you, Peter. The event is Flowing with Unknowingness, where we practice freestyle rap and spoken word as a psychotech for deepening our relationships with uncertainty and building trust and communitas together. Uh, the beat that we play and we all listen to together provides a sort of shared environment that is uh, facilitates and catalyzes our creative flow states. And it's a lot of fun and conviviality well, I didn't hear a mention here, I don't think, but that is one of the key pillars, Jim Rutt says, of a, of a proto B and making it work. And so at Flowing With Unknowingness, we bring the conviviality. So if you want to get convivial with me, then there's the link. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter. Cool. And I'm tempted to take an Rhea behind you for the existential dance party that's, that's coming. But uh, um, 
I'll, I'll just say Ray is going to do a, an existential dance party uh, for some kind of, kind of time in Christmas. So we'll work on that. Um, so that being said, uh, I posted the links for the STOA, uh, Patreon, and Substack. Uh, that being said, Jim, if you're still here, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the STOA today.